Hi everyone, welcome to another video on the Every Circuit Lab tutorial. Today we're going to be going through the op amp lab. Um, this usually would be probably one of the harder labs to complete when you're actually in the lab, um, just because it's working with a new component that you haven't seen before. But um, doing it in software is actually much better because, uh, as you can see, the bubbles are much like what we uh, actually use in class to describe the op amp and that sort of thing. So. It should make your life a little simpler. So that without wasting too much time, let's go ahead and if you've done the pre-lab, we can just jump right into the very first circuit. So the very first circuit asks us to create an inverting amplifier. And uh, the whole point of an inverting amplifier is basically to have the input uh, fully amplified through the uh, output and in an inverting fashion so that the input is inverted uh, or sorry the output is inverted from what the input was um, so with there there's a simple equation that you use to basically calculate the gain uh, of this particular op amp and the, the equation is this resistor over this resistor and that gives you the gain for this particular op amp um, so without that with that being said what I'll have here is a gain of about um, 5 volts per volt because we'll have 35 divided by 7 which is 5 so we should see this 500 millivolt signal increase by about 5 times so it should get to about 2.5 volts on the output so let's go ahead and run that there and you can see the gain of my op amp is actually very very low So there we go. Now we can see at 500 millivolts input, we have negative 2.5 volts on the output. And as you saw what I did there, the gain of my op amp here wasn't nearly infinity. So it wasn't acting as an ideal op amp. And in that case, we didn't have uh, the whole input getting through to the output. So in this case, where our, our voltage gain on the actual op amp is is closer to infinity, um, we have this phenomenon going on, which is the ideal op amp phenomena. Um, this is this is more like the uh, the uh, voltage gain you'll actually see in an ideal op amp under these conditions. Um, but there are some op amps under some particular conditions and applications that uh, that unfortunately can't run at these uh, high voltage gains. And in that case, we need to uh, do other stuff to eliminate some of those problems. All right, now that that's done, let's go ahead and we'll change this wave to a sinusoidal wave. It's at one kilohertz, and let's switch its amplitude to, I believe, uh, 0.5 volts peak to peak. So that would be 250 millivolts in amplitude. So we'll go ahead and switch that up. So once we have that wave, we can see our input is, well, it should be 500 millivolts peak to peak. And our output is exactly two and a half volts peak to peak. And that makes sense based on our calculations that RF over RI equals exactly five volts per volt. So that this uh, signal should be amplified by negative five volts per volt is true. Um, as you can see, the, the sine wave, it, it's hard to see that it's inverted, but um, just know that because this is an inverting op amp that you're putting it into the inverting terminal, so the wave that at the input is going to be inverted from the wave of the output. Uh, basically, that, that's something that you should remember always. So now we'll increase the signal here until we observe some clipping. And clipping is a new phenomena for you guys and I'll show you exactly what it is as soon as we hit it eventually you'll see the peaks and the troughs start to flatten out and where they start to flatten out that is called the clipping point
All right. So it looks around 3.1 volts or so we could go with. And for my particular setup here, I have a, um, a clipping range of around 3.1 volts. So I would just uh, mark that value in like I was told. And um, yeah, don't worry about connecting connecting the wave jet generator to the high setting. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of these physical uh, physical things that he's telling us to do in the lab just because we have software to be able to do these things. Um, and then just note the peak to peak voltage of this clipped output, output waveform. So the uh, peak to peak voltage would be 30 volts peak to peak on this output. All right, so moving on here now, the next circuit we have is called the summing amplifier. And the summing amplifier is only slightly different from the uh, inverting amplifier that we just did, in that it has a, a, a DC or another AC component um, that is added along as a second signal, as you can see here. So in this case, we're using a DC uh, signal of 500 millivolts. So Basically, the way I like to analyze these is I like to analyze them as a single network on their own, and then they basically they sum together. So this first network would be a 500 millivolt input, right? And 35k divided by a 7k is a five volts to five volts per volt in amplification, right? So let's say it was just the DC wave, right? Our our DC wave should be centered at negative two and a half volts because we would have negative five multiplied by 500 millivolts, right? Which would give us negative 2.5 volts. But if I was then to add in this sinusoidal wave, what would happen there? Okay, so let's think about that. So if I have a DC wave that is traveling at negative two and a half volts, right? That, that DC wave doesn't have any peaks or troughs, right? So it, it's staying at a static point. So then where do you think this wave, the AC wave, will be centered around? If you said that it would be centered right around the negative two and a half volt part, you're, you're exactly right. Because this, whatever voltage is, or whatever wave is getting amplified from the AC, should be centered right at whatever the uh, amplified whatever the amplified voltage from the DC source is. So at this in this case we're at negative 2.5 volts on our DC source. So we know that our AC source should be centered at negative 2.5 volts and it's also amplified by a 5 to 5 volts volt per volt. So then we know that this 250 millivolts in amplitude which is 500 millivolts peak to peak should give us 2.5 volts on our output uh, in the peak to peak range. And that should be centered at negative two and a half volts. So it should be going down to five volts and it should be going up to zero volts. And let's see if that's true. Sorry, yeah. I I completely misspoke. It should be going up to three, ne down to negative 3.75 and up to negative 1.25, which would be a 1.25 volt uh, amplitude from a 2.5 volt peak to peak. And then look up the difference online between an AC and a DC coupled scope. Um, if we ever get back into the classroom, it is going to be a uh, so imperative that you guys learn what the difference is between AC and DC coupling uh, because in your third year course where you deal strictly with op amps and that sort of thing it is uh, it is such a skill to have um, it only gets harder from here so just knowing what that is is uh, is a big big plus next it asks us to increase the DC level until we notice some clipping just like last time So now that we know what clipping is, we'll be looking for flat tops and flat bottoms. A 
Well, that definitely looks flat on the bottom. you just saw it's extremely finicky so you might have to move with the individual adjustments on the dial um, and if you do that I found a solution with such a clip just on the bottom at 2.76 volts so I would mark that down uh, for number four on the 3.2 circuit and that will be marked by my TA so the next circuit we're gonna look at is called the differentiator circuit. The differentiator circuit is going to be a little bit trickier to actually see um, what's going on just because we don't have the ability to stop our scope in real time. So uh, in a lab setting we have the ability to stop the trace and actually uh, analyze it and, and do some things with with a still photo. But in this case um, we're just going to have to rely on you guys to be able to take a photo, maybe, of the moving scope and then analyze it from there. So let's go ahead and we will look at the parameters here that I've chosen. I've just chosen random uh, parameters such that it's a little bit different from what you guys are doing in your lab. Um, I, I connected a 0 0.5 volt uh, peak to peak. I'll do 500 millivolts. So that's one volt peak to peak for me. Um, and it says to go to 1K. So I will go ahead and I'll run that. And it says to sketch V out and V in as they appear together. So what I would do is as this is running, um, I would try to slow it down maybe as much as you can like that. Just try to get a nice photo of of that particular screen there. Um, if you can, you could easily mark a point on the wave and then calculate the phase difference um, just based, just using a ruler and, and using a, what would appear to be one wavelength and seeing that um, is exactly half a wavelength uh, apart from each other, these two waves. And that would, it, that would in, it indicate that if you put in a sine wave here, right? and they're off by half a wavelength, then what would you have? You would uh, have a cosine wave on the output. Um, so just things like that. In, you, you have to be intuitive with this um, because we don't have the, the full set of tools that are at your disposal right now. So um, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult, but uh, I, I think you guys can figure it out. So you're gonna do that, calculate the phase difference and then increase this uh, frequency just to two kilohertz. And then sketch the input and the output again. Um, it's much of the same, it's just a little more uh, bunched up because the, the waves are coming in quicker. Um, yeah, that's all you guys really need to know for that one. Lastly, it asks you to uh, switch to a triangular waveform. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that ability within this software to do a triangular waveform. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would uh, just note that on number five and say, uh, using the software we have available to us, we are not able to, uh, to perform this part of the experiment. But you could think about it conceptually as well. Uh, if I was to put in a sine wave, right? That is just sine WT, right? And if I was to differentiate that wave, what would I get, right? So it's the same as just differentiating in your calculus class. So if I differentiate a sine WT, I get a cos WT, right? So if I differentiated a triangular waveform, what would I get on the end? 
what would I get on the output? Now we'll move on to the high pass filter. The high pass filter is actually going to be so, so much easier than it would be in an actual lap setting because filling out your eight line table in uh, number two here is going to be so, so much easier than it ever would be in a lap because in a lap setting, you need to go through each individual frequency and mark down the points that you get. Uh, in this, you can do uh, a frequency suite and it will basically give you every point from about zero hertz to, I believe it's one megahertz. Um, so, with that being said, let's go ahead and look at the circuit that I built here. So the circuit I built uh, uses different values than the ones you guys are gonna have, obviously. Um, just to show you some different circuits. Um, and, we're gonna look at how the gain and the phase difference of the input and the output signals change with the frequency. Filters are very important in RF applications and many other fields, and uh, you guys will learn about them uh, in much more detail next year in your third year electronics course. And uh, they're honestly very, very useful and very, very fun, so. So. Without further ado, let's go ahead, and this time we're gonna run the AC. So the AC, what that does is it gives us a frequency sweep, like I said, from, I believe, uh, oh, it's actually only around 50K, 50K? Maybe you can go farther. Yeah, you can go farther somehow. I don't know where those things are going, but, um, you can go farther and all the way down to around zero hertz, which makes sense. So we want to take some measurements at uh, 300 hertz, 600 hertz, 1.2K, 2.5K. So let's go ahead. We'll go up to 300. And this is on the log scale, so it's very, very weird. Moving in between points. So we go to 300. We can take the magnitude of the output versus the input, right? And we can also take the phase difference between the two waves at those two particular points. So we can see my phase difference is around 90 degrees and my magnitude is around negative uh, 90 dBs at that point. So I'll go up to 600 Hertz. There we're at uh, negative around 13 dBs and the phase difference is still uh, 90 degrees. It's staying pretty con it's consistent between that range. Um, 1.2K, 2.5. There's 1.2K. So there we're getting closer to our negative three dB cutoff. Uh, and we're at uh, phase difference. Uh, it's, it's decreasing slightly, um, but it, it's still, uh, on, on a slow decrease there. At 2.5, we can see we're just under one dB, so we're at around 500 millidBs. And our phase difference is definitely changing now. We're, uh, we can see we're going from, it looks like negative 90 to negative 180. So we go to five kilohertz. We can see we have a magnitude of, we're on our upslope here, and we have a gain of around five dBs, or you can call it four and a half. Um, and our phase difference is definitely decreasing now. Uh, we're at negative 115 degrees. And 10 kilohertz is right here at this point. Our output versus our input is increasing by uh, 8.77 dB, and our phase difference is decreasing to negative 133 degrees. And at 20 kilohertz, we have a magnitude of a uh, gain of 11 dBs, and our phase is at around negative 152 degrees. 
and we'll do one last one at 40 kilohertz just to show you that it's leveling off now uh, the magnitude is around 11 dBs right and that makes sense because uh, we were just at 11 when we're at uh, 20 kilohertz and we can see that our gain isn't increasing much so we're we're at that uh, that pass band point and our phase is uh, around negative 165 degrees so it'll go down a little bit from there to 180 to be exact but uh, not much not much at all and our gain actually levels off at 12 dBs as you can see in the pass band there but um, without further ado I believe that is it for this circuit make sure you're as you're doing this you're uh, taking all those values in an Excel table uh, just so you could plot this on your own um, calculate the gain of the filter which it already gives you the gain and uh, calculate the slopes yeah so that's the reason why I, I'd like you to take some points and then uh, you could put that in Excel just find a line of best fit and calculate a slope for that line um, and, and then compared to the theoretical 20 dB per decade it should be almost exactly that if not um, there's something a little funky there but uh, yeah all right so the second last circuit we're gonna make here is called the integrator circuit the integrator does the opposite of the differentiator of course and uh, differentiates the signal so if we connected a sine wave what should we get out right we should get a a negative cos wave. So um, he's asking us to well, input a, a square wave, but let's first go to a sine wave just so we can prove the theory behind this circuit. Um, so I'm just showing the output right now, but if I show the input as well, and I'm going to show them on different scales. Hmm. So I just adjusted my numbers a little bit so we could get a better look at the output waveform. But as you can see, the output waveform is doing the opposite of what it was doing last time. So every time uh, the sine wave, the input is going up, the uh, cos wave is actually going down, which is the opposite of what it was doing before. Before it was it was following the same path, but uh, yeah. So. As the sine wave went up, the cos wave went up as well and uh, in this case as the sine wave goes up the cos wave actually goes down. So that proves some of the theory behind the integrator that uh, if we input a sine wave we should get a negative cosine wave out. Um, now let's go ahead and switch to a square wave. And once we switch to a square wave let's turn uh, this wave off we don't want to view that anymore let's just view the output and we can see our output here it it looks like a messed up triangle to be honest um, I'm gonna try to get it a little uh, better looking than that for you yeah so there you go so we can see that it is integrating the square wave into a triangular wave and this is basically the only way we can get a triangular wave in this software um, so that's interesting and uh, this is basically should resemble your sketch for your input and output waveforms so now we're just gonna make a simple modification to the circuit uh, so let's go ahead and pause that rewind and we'll get rid of that branch we will get rid of that particular component. Lock that back up. And we'll switch this back to a sine wave. So, um, it wants us to do the exact same thing again. So we're gonna have a, an eight line table and we're gonna go through some different frequencies and we're going to actually see uh, how this is acting as a low pass filter. Um, so let's go ahead and without further ado, once you have the circuit set up again and just remove that um, particular uh, capacitor, you can go ahead and run your AC analysis. 
and your AC analysis will look like this. So as we can see, the shape of the filter is the exact opposite. Last time it was going up, right? And this time it is going down this way. So um, we're gonna get the exact same points as last time. 300, 600, 1.2, 2.5, 5, 10, 20, and 40. And we're gonna go ahead and I, I highly suggest you mark them in an Excel table so you can um, calculate the theoretical slope using a line of best fit. Uh, that's in question three. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and we can see that our constant gain here uh, at the first point of 300 hertz is around here and it is around negative 10 dB okay and the phase difference is around 180 degrees so the phase difference looks like it's dropping from 180 degrees to 90 degrees and the gain looks like it's dropping from somewhere around uh, negative 10 dBs to around negative 30 dBs in total. So let's go ahead, move up here to 600. You can see our magnitude on our gain is, is pretty much the same. It's actually a little bit higher. Um, this can be due to some ripple effects in the passband, uh, but we won't talk about those until your third year courses. And we can see the phase difference is uh, still around 180 degrees, two degrees lower than that, but more or less the same. Uh, 1.2, what do we want to do next? At 1.2, we can see our gain still hasn't decreased at all. Actually, it's increased yet again. Uh, and our phase difference is actually uh, 176, so it's went down by another two degrees there. So now we're going to be at 2.5 kilohertz. At 2.5 kilohertz, our, our gain actually hasn't went down at all. Again, increased, uh, but our phase um, is it, it's, it's slowly going down. Um, it's only went down by nine degrees, so it, it's not like it's a huge huge difference that you could even visibly really see on the waveform, but uh, it uh, it's there. So, 5 kilohertz. Our gain's at negative 10 dB, so it's, it's finally at this highest point, and uh, the phase is at 163. Or sorry, the gain is dropping now. Yeah. So at uh, 10 kilohertz, we're at negative 11.1 and a phase difference of 148. 20 kilohertz. At 20 kilohertz, we're at around negative 14 dBs and we have a phase difference of 128 degrees. And at 40 kilohertz, we're at negative 18.2 decibels, and uh, we have a phase difference of around 112. So again, there's a level off somewhere, right? And it should level off um, at 90 degrees. So at 90 degrees, our gain keeps going down, as you can see, at 20 dBs per decade, but our phase uh, remains constant at 90 degrees throughout to like even in to terahertz we're able to go actually with this so with that being said um the last thing it wants us to do is input a square wave here so let's go ahead and run that back put a square wave here and then it wants us to sketch the output waveform So, last but not least, it asks us to input a square wave. 
So I put in a square wave of frequency equal to one kilohertz, so that would be a period of one millisecond. Uh, and I can see the output here. Yeah. So you're going to sketch the input and the output in your uh, lab, I guess, and uh, hand that into your TA. So without further ado, I believe that is the end of the lab series. So good luck to everyone on completing all your labs. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact me or your TAs or your professor. Um, we all have a fairly good idea of what to do, and um, we're ready to take your questions, so let me just know.